Lewis from the University of Connecticut. My talk today is about measuring information content of systematic data using amazing methods. And I'd like to begin by thanking my collaborators, Ming-Li Chen and Lin Kuo in the Department of Statistics and Louise Lewis and Carolyn Kuchikova in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. All of us are at the University of Connecticut. I'd also would like to acknowledge my uh, NSF support and the Yukon Bioinformatics Facility for computational support. Information allows us to sort things, for example, tree topologies from best to worst. The prior distribution shown here places equal probability on all three possible root unrooted tree topologies for four taxa and thus carries no information. The amount of information carried by a probability distribution can be measured by its entropy. This prior distribution has the maximum possible entropy uh, because the probability mass is spread as evenly as possible across all the possible tree topologies. So maximum entropy corresponds to zero information. Suppose that we carry out a Bayesian phylogenetic analysis using that prior, and the posterior distribution heavily favors tree topology one over the other two tree topologies. The posterior distribution has much less entropy, and thus carries much more information about the tree topology than does the prior. Because the prior was not informative, not informative, this information must have come from the data through the likelihood function. The kullback leibler divergence, or KL divergence, uh, measures the relative entropy of two probability distributions. The relative entropy of the posterior distribution compared to the prior directly measures the amount of new information that's coming in by the, through the data. In this example, a, a coin was flipped three times, n equals three, and came up uh, heads twice, so that's why y equals two. It's easy to see that the information contained in only these three flips is enough to concentrate the posterior and discourage consideration of some extreme values of theta, which in this case is the unknown true probability that the coin will land heads on any given flip. If no information about this unknown parameter theta was present in the data, the posterior would equal the prior, and the KL uh, divergence measure would be zero. KL, it's important to point out that KL measures relative entropy. So it's in, that's important if the prior itself has information that's informative. Both examples shown here are based on the, exactly the same data, so the absolute amount of information in the data is the same in both cases. However, KL is smaller on the right there because the prior is considerably more informative. So the information that's provided by the data in this case is largely redundant. We've seen that KL can be useful in the continuous case, but today I want to focus on the discrete version of KL, and it's used in measuring information specifically about tree topology. The calculation involves the marginal posterior probability and the corresponding prior probability of each possible tree topology. Uh, the value of n, which is the number of possible tree topologies, can of course be quite huge, but the calculation is manageable because only tree topologies that were actually sampled contribute to this sum. This KL measure achieves its minimum value of zero when the marginal posterior distribution of tree topologies is identical to the prior distribution, that's no information, and it achieves its maximum value when all the posterior probability is concentrated in just one tree topology. So that's the maximum possible information. So knowing these limits allows us to express KL as a percent of its maximum possible value, which is convenient for comparison across uh, different studies. This, this five taxon example, for example, using all 1,296 sites from one gene provides nearly 98% of the maximum possible information content. We're down to just two trees, and one of them is heavily favored over the other. While using data from only five sites, um, results in a posterior that's very similar to the, the non-informative prior that's just spread evenly over the 105 trees. Uh, and so it only has 0.1% of the maximum possible information content. Surprisingly, at least it was to me initially, that it only, including only 12% of the sites, or 12.5% of the sites, yield more than 50% of the information. So uh, information does not grow linearly with the amount of data. Uh, so there's diminishing returns on your data investment, as, as was pointed out by Lacey Knowles and her SSP. A few simple four taxon simulations will serve to illustrate that KALE sort of works as you expect as a measure of topological information content in many contexts of interest to systematists. So incre information increases with the number of sites, as you might expect. It decreases with the relative rate of substitution. So as sites become more noisy, you have, it tells you that you have less and less information. As you increase the proportion of missing data, uh, KL goes down, as you might expect. Uh, 
Uh, and then as rate heterogeneity, this is among site rate heterogeneity increases, you also lose information. And that's because if you have a lot of rate heterogeneity, there's a few sites that are evolving really fast and really noisy and thus don't have inf any information. And then there's most sites that are evolving really slowly and they also don't have much information because there are many of them are constant sites. KL provides uh, an objective measure of saturation. So saturation means that a site has undergone so many substitutions that there is no longer any information about history. In this example, the standard saturation plot of raw pairwise dissimilarity on the x-axis against corrected pairwise distance on the y-axis would clearly lead to a verdict of saturation for these third position sites. And many of us would be tempted to throw out those third position sites. However, using only these sites uh, in an analysis yields a tree that doesn't conflict with and provides strong support for many of the groups that are supported by analyses of just first and second position sites. So KL indicates that third position sites have 77% of the maximum possible topological information and thus are very far from being considered saturated. So stripping these third position sites would in this case involve throwing away perfectly good information. Uh, so I want to set up an example uh, of the use of KL in measuring uh, saturation. And so we need to talk about OB sorting. So observed variability or OB sorting has been used in several recent studies as a way to justify stripping some subset of sites from an alignment that are judged too noisy or saturated. So OB is calculated for an individual site by computing the average over all possible pairwise comparisons of taxa. Uh, constant sites thus yield OB equals zero. Um, and this, this particular site, because every possible pairwise comparison is, yields a difference, we give an OB of one, the maximum possible value. And then this site is intermediate, where four of the six possible pairwise comparisons for this site give you ones, and so OB is four over six or two thirds. One of the alleged benefits of the OB method is that trees are not used, and actually models are not used in its calculation, allowing it to avoid assumptions about the tree topology or branch lengths, or even the model's uh, assumptions. So this advantage is kind of illusory though, I think because the tree topology is critical for determining whether a site is noisy or not. Um, so for example, here's a case where five substitutions at minimum are required to explain the data based on that tree topology. But based on this tree topology, the same data can be explained by just one substitution. So here's a noisy site or a very slow evolving site and both of them have the same value of OB. So we can't distinguish all the time between sites that are noisy and sites that are that are relatively, uh, relatively good sites that just happen to change sort of in the middle of the tree so you get a big group of, of uh, taxa that have one state and a big group that have the other state yielding a lot of pairwise differences when you calculate OB. As an example of the use of kale to measure information content and assess saturation, I'll consider the analysis of Zhang et al. 2011 to explore the placement of the gym sperm group B. Tailies using OB sorting and stripping. Using the entire core plus genomes, the Nitalis group with the, the Impressophytes, a grouping that represents what's called the NICUP hypothesis. Zhang et al. found that removing the worst 2250 sites, uh, according to OB, caused a switch to the alternative deep pine hypothesis in which the Nitalis group with the pines and their closest relatives. Zhang et al. argued that the sites with the highest OB scores represent noisy, saturated sites, which models often find difficult to fit because such sites have often have different nucleotide compositions and may exhibit heterotachy and other problems that, that sites that are more slowly evolving don't have. So KL provides a natural way to assess whether these sites that they're stripping out are actually uh, saturated. So we did, uh, we measured KL for 13 data sets, each comprising 1,000 sites. At each successive uh, uh, removal step, uh, we have 1,000 sites that are removed that represent the worst sites still remaining in the alignment according to the OB criterion. So KL indicates that the sites excluded by Zhang et al. are not at all saturated and instead have substantial, substantial information about tree topology, exceeding 80% of the maximum possible information content. It's only when about 9,000 sites removed that the information drops substantially. Sites being excluded at this point are primarily uh, constant sites or autapomorphous sites. So it's clear that the sites removed by, by Zhang et al. are not saturated, but it's not so clear that the information that they carry is actually um, correct information. So information doesn't necessarily equal good information. It could be bad information or misleading information. So is the signal in these OB worst sites misleading? So they used the program, the Zhang et al. used the program Misfits to identify site, sites with patterns that were either under or overrepresented based on 
uh, a particular tree topology and substitution model. About half of these misfits were among the 2250 worst OB sites they removed. So there's some basis for their claim that high OB sites are enriched for potentially misleading signal. Interestingly, however, OB also excluded 68 slowly evolving sites with no homoplasy that supported the, the knee cup hypothesis that's supported by the entire chloroplast genomes. These sites had high OB values not because they had a high rate, but because they changed once in the middle of the tree on the very branch that supports the knee cup hypothesis. So it seems that removing that OB removed many perfectly good characters along with many misleading sites. Many of the good sites were those that support the knee cup hypothesis. My colleagues and I recently introduced uh, conditional predictive ordinates or CPO to phylogenetics. CPO measures how well a model can predict the data for one site given the data for all the other sites. So it's a cross-validation as well as posterior predictive method. So CPO is correlated with rate because even with the best model, the perfect model, the model that you use to generate the data, it's difficult to predict the patterns produced by high rate sites because they're very complex. However, patterns that are produced by slowly evolving sites are mostly constant sites that are easy to predict, so there's a correlation. Uh, but CPO is also low for sites that just don't fit the model well for one reason or another. If you compare CPO sorted with OB sorted sites, it's clear that CPO actually puts the worst sites, the, many of these misfits, concentrates them better in the end of the alignment where, you, where, you're, where you're starting to strip. Um, so, um, so sorting uh, sites using CPO does a much, much better job of concentrating these misfits. Um, and um, so we would also, uh, it eliminates 85% of misfits if you, if you delete the 2250 worst CPO worst sites compared to 55% for the OB, and it leaves only six ideal sites compared to 68 for, o, for OB. If you um, compare KL for CPO versus OB strip data sets, so we're starting to strip the data sets from the worst to the best according to these two criteria. We look at the mid information as measured by KL. Uh, it's interesting that the, stripping the worst sites leads to an increase in information content. That's, that suggests that some conflicting signal is present in these sites. CPO-based stripping, uh, however, never supports this knee-pine hypothesis. That, su that suggests that analyses using complete chloroplast genomes were in fact not misled by noisy or misinformative sites. OB-based stripping does support knee-pine after the first 2,000 sites are removed, but contrary to the conclusions of Zhang et al., we believe this is due to the fact that OB stripping removes many reliable sites uh, that support the NECUP hypothesis. The fact that KL information begins to drop much earlier uh, in the OB stripping process suggests that important <coughs> signal bearing sites are being removed uh, by OB early on. In conclusion, uh, it is, it's always true that uh, there are, there are always sites that are not fit well by the model, and we feel that, that CPO does a better job of identifying such sites compared to OB. Our main point, however, is that using this pullback libeler or KL divergence to measure the relative entropy of the posterior compared to the prior can be a useful tool for answering many questions about information content, only some of which I've had a time, time to address in this talk, such as whether a particular subset of sites is saturated, how many information in the tree topology or other model parameters is contained in a particular data subset, and whether information from one data subset conflicts with information from other data subsets. sites, those are sites that still don't fit the model, uh, interestingly. So if you have, like, for, for example, a rare uh, substitution, like a transversion that happens on a really short branch, you know, that, that, could, have, that could be the only change, and it could be perfectly non-homoplasious, but that's something that the model is not expecting, and so that's the kind of sites that it includes that does that. Something that's confusing the model, but you can see how to put that. But out of 33,000 sites, you're probably going to get a couple of sites that are just weird like that. 